Talk Zone presents the Geek Speak Radio Show with your hosts, Henry and Romo. Your top spot for everything entertainment and pop culture, including TV, movies, comics, casting news, and more. Now, here are your hosts, Henry and Romo. Today, Trekkies, it's your day. They spawned the movies. Yeah, I did. You all know this. We all remember the, uh, the motion picture. After that, however came what is widely considered by all Star Trek fans one of the best, the Empire Strikes Back, we'll call it, of, of the Star Trek movies. That was the Wrath of Khan. Yes, it's true. Khan! Exactly. That's what it remembers for. Khan! Yeah. Yes, that is one of my favorite scenes. The person responsible for that is on the phone with us. Nice. He is writer, director, author, Nicholas Meyer. Nicholas, you there? I am. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. I'm very flattered to be asked. Yeah, and, and you know you're gonna get a lot of that. We're, we're, we'll take some calls uh, later on, maybe, and some emails, definitely. But it is definitely one of uh, a lot of Star Trek fans. They do consider the Wrath of Khan, like I said, the Empire Strikes Back of all the Star Trek movies, and they also love the Undiscovered Country and the fact that you co-wrote also um, the uh, Star Trek IV. We'll get into all that in just a second. Before we do that, let's start with Nicholas Meyer. Let's start with you. Let's start with the novel you wrote, Seven Point Solution. Um, not seven percent. So yeah, much. 7%, that's right. Why did you agree to script the film, given your proclivity to dislike any of the uh, Sherlock Holmes films, as you mentioned in the book? Well, the book itself was written as a kind of corrective to uh, other Sherlock Holmes movies or pastiches. I had the idea in my head, for whatever reason, that I was the only person fit to channel Arthur Conan Doyle. When you're young, you think like that. And... Um, so I, I thought, I know how to do this, and what's more, I have a great idea to do it with, namely Sherlock Holmes meets Sigmund Freud. And so I sat down and wrote my novel, chiefly for my own amusement, since the world uh, didn't know I existed. Um, I wrote it during a Writers Guild strike in Hollywood, where we weren't allowed to write screenplays. And then I sold it, uh, it, it was published and became the number one best-selling novel in the United States for 40 weeks on the New York Times um, list of, of bestsellers. And suddenly I was catapulted from obscurity. And when Universal Pictures wanted to buy the rights for the film, I said, well, I'll sell you the rights, but i got to write the screenplay. Because at that point, I suddenly had intimations of another campy version of Sherlock Holmes, and I wanted to make sure that it, I didn't add to that number. And they said, what, okay, "What is it about you can write?" What is it about the uh, the films and everything that's come out, uh, especially the uh, the current one that's out now uh, with uh, Robert Downey Jr.? What is it about those films that you don't that don't hit that chord with you? Well, I haven't seen the new one, so I can't comment. Um, but I can tell you about the other ones, that when I read the Conan Doyle stories, the 60 Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, they all seemed very real to me. But every time I watched the movies, they seemed sort of camp. And I'll give you just one example, um, but, it, but it will resonate and make my point. I never understood, for example, uh, Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson to Basil Rathbone, Sherlock Holmes, because I couldn't figure out why a genius would hang out with an idiot. And <laughs> Nigel Bruce always played him as a dummy. And I thought, but he, he's not a dummy. Watson is, he's an average guy. He's not a sub-average guy. And Holmes's vanity, of which he had no shortage, was much too sophisticated to be satisfied with the you know gawps of amazement by somebody who was an imbecile. Plus, I couldn't visualize Nigel Bruce as the narrative voice in the stories that I was reading. They just it didn't go together. Um, so it just seemed way out of whack. And there just always seemed to be something sort of campy or mannered ab about the way it was always done. It wasn't done. It seemed to me real. Uh, just play these people as if they were real. Even the Jeremy Brett on television, which was pretty good in many ways, but I thought, gosh, he's awful twitchy. 
Um, and I don't remember Doyle writing about Holmes being twitchy. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen the, uh, the, the new one out either, and I know they're going to make a sequel to it. And not, again, not because uh, I don't like Robert Downey Jr. or anything. I but love Robert just, Downey Jr. I think he's a genius. Yeah, exactly. But I agree with you. That it does seem, especially the way they, they, they marketed the film with the trailers and everything, it's more like um, like an action film more than, than capturing the spirit of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Well, that's, that's what, what I worry uh, about is that, uh, yeah. you know, Holmes described as a thinking machine. Um, and yes... Doyle does say that he was an athlete, that he was a boxer and a single stick player, um, but I'm not sure that it was that that was the sort of what jumps out in the foreground uh, when you think about Holmes as Doyle wrote him. In fact, I'm sure it is. Right. Yeah. And the Seven Percent Solution, I'm sure we can find it now on Netflix or it's on a DVD, right? I think, uh, well, there is a DVD of the 7% solution. It's very hard to obtain. I keep asking Universal to put out a proper DVD of the movie, and they keep saying no. So you just have to look for this very, very scarce DVD of uh, the 7% solution that did come out. Do they tell you why not or just no? They said it's too expensive. It's not worth it to us. Hmm. Okay, well. It is hard to find. Uh, one film that is on Netflix, I just watched it the other night, as a matter of fact, again, is Time After Time, which was the, your first film that you directed. Correct. What, uh, what, mem- what memories do you have, good or bad, uh, directing and working with uh, Time After Time? Well, it was, it was the most fun I'd ever had in the daytime. <laughs> um, I Really, it was a dream come true. I knew I had a very, very solid script. It's funny because the screenplay for the 7% Solution was nominated for an Oscar, and I have all kinds of criticisms that I can level at that screenplay. I think I became a much better screenwriter after I had directed uh, some movies. And I thought, you know, well, if you're going to, if you're handing out Oscars, I not only should have been nominated for time after time, I should have won, uh, because I thought that was a really first-class piece of work in ways that the screenplay of The 7% Solution, I have a lot more problems with. I think it's it's intelligent and it's entertaining, but I think it's very, very talky, and you learn to be much more efficient as a screenwriter after you've directed a movie and see how much space all those words take on the screen. So... Um, I had a really good time. I had never, I had directed stage plays, I had directed radio plays, but I'd never directed a movie. So I had a wonderful cast. My leading man was falling in love with my leading lady while the cameras rolled. Um, I used to say to every member of the crew before we started, when I was interviewing them, I would say, well, you have to understand I don't know anything. You have to not mind that I don't know anything, and you have to not get mad if I still want to do it my way after you explain to me, you know, the right way. Right. And anybody who could withstand that catechism uh, stayed in the movie. And it was really a glorious experience. I look at the movie now, and of course, all I can see are the things that I did wrong as first-time director, but Because the script and the performances are so strong, nobody seems to really care about those things, and the movie seems to be dear to many people, which is lovely to learn. Yeah, I still enjoy watching it, like I said. And you also wrote a book last year called The View from the Bridge, which just came out on on paperback. And in there, yeah, in there, in the time when you're talking about uh, time after time, you give a story. I don't want to give too much away from the book. We do want people to go out and get it, of course. But you mentioned a story. From one of the after you finished filming the scene, one of the stagehands actually gave you a suggestion to change a line. Tell us mm-hmm. about that story. Well, as I as I say, this was the first film I ever directed, and we had uh, finished a scene and broken for our lunch break. And uh, this guy, who was an electrician from way high up in the soundstage, came down and said, "So you're the author of this, as well as the director, right?" I said, "Yes." And he said, well, uh, he's saying the wrong thing there, if you want my opinion. 
And I sort of did want his opinion because I think that a lot of times on Hollywood film sets, people uh, use the technicians only for what they're good at. So that if you're watching the dailies and you're sitting next to the costumer and you say, well, what do you think of the scene? And she'll go, well, all the costumes, all the hemlines are straight. <laughs> but that really limits them as artists and as human beings to making a meaningful contribution. So when this guy said he's saying the wrong line, I was kind of intrigued. And I said, so I said, what should he be saying? And then he told me what he, he, he thought the guy should say. And it was so much better than what I had. I said, okay, we're going to come back and film your line after lunch. Um, and I was very excited by this because it made it feel like a real collaboration. And I was excited that this guy was interested enough in what we were doing to think about this. And also that he felt comfortable enough because uh, some directors would just have fired him. Um, yeah. But... And, and and so then I, when the word of that got around, I think my crew felt a lot freer to make contributions. I could always say no, and whether I said no or whether I said yes, my name is the one that's going to get the credit at the end of the day anyway. So I could, right. you know, pillage all sorts of people's good ideas or reject the bad ones or hope that that's what I'm doing. Um and it made it a collaborative experience for me, and that's one of the reasons why I loved making Time After Time so much. There's a whole chapter in, in my memoir, which, as you point out, has just come out in paperback, The View from the Bridge, Memories right. of Star Trek and a Life in Hollywood, that tells all about this stuff. Right, and before you guys run out and go buy it, don't. It's on GeekSpeakRadioShow.com. I have a link to the Amazon. You can go on and get it on there. Geek Speak Radio Show will be right back.